warm welcome to this ET Now program, where we are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Deep Subarao, former Governor, Reserve Bank of India. <laughs> Dr. Subarao is a physicist from IIT who topped the 1972 civil service examination and then went on to become Finance Secretary, Government of India, before taking over as RBI Governor while picking up a doctorate in economics on the way. He was at the helm of affairs in the RBI during the 2008 global financial crisis then seen as the worst economic crisis in recent memory, till the pandemic, of course. So his analysis and insights into the parallels and the differences between the situation today and in 2008 and the policy responses are particularly relevant today. Welcome to the show, Dr. Subara. Thank you very much. Let me start by asking you the obvious question. How do you see the macroeconomic scenario, both globally and in India today? Well, globally, the IMF says that this is the deepest and most extensive recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And the IMF also says that the recovery out of this crisis is going to be long, uneven, and uncertain. One thing we have to note that what you mentioned in the introduction is that this crisis is different from the 2008 global financial crisis because the 2008 crisis originated in the financial sector, the solution lay in the financial sector, the solution was in the hands of the governments and central banks. And they knew that if financial stability is restored, if confidence in the financial system is restored, rest, everything will fall in place. On the other hand, this crisis is because of a cause outside of the economic system, outside of the financial system. The solution has to come from science. All that the governments and central banks can do, meanwhile, is to hold forth. So what I would say is that this crisis is different from the 2008 crisis because of the level and depth of uncertainty. And of course, one important consequence of this crisis globally is going to be the accentuation of inequalities within and across countries. Yeah, you're right on that, Dr. Subarao, that this is very different. But after the global financial crisis in 2008, when you were governor, RBI was quick to respond and rapidly eased equity. But now I must add with the wisdom of hindsight, because RBI really has to act real time, while commentators like me have the advantage of hindsight. Many of the problems in the later years, including the high non-performing assets, have been attributed to excessively loose fiscal and monetary policy. This time round two, the RBI has responded to the slowdown caused by the pandemic. But as we watch the evolving situation, excess liquidity of close to 8 lakh crores, high inflation, asset bubbles in the stock and commodity markets, is there a sense of deja vu, a sense that the lessons of 2008 have not been learned by the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Subarao? I don't think I'll agree with your surmise, Maitri. It is true that uh, one of the important lessons of the 2008 crisis is that as much as you ease aggressively during the crisis in order to reverse and you know, help recover the economy, it's also very important to exit out of expansionary policies uh, in good time. Uh, in today, to respond to this crisis, the RBI has eased aggressively. They cut policy rates. Policy rates today are uh, negative in real terms and have injected an extraordinary amount of liquidity, like you mentioned, the 8 trillion rupees, which is the banking system surplus that is flowing into the reverse repo window of the RBI on a day on a regular basis. But I'm sure that the RBI is aware, we know why RBI has done this, in order to infuse confidence in the economy, in order to preserve financial stability, in order to support recovery. At the same time, we are aware of concerns on the inflation front, Inflation has been above RBS target for the last several months. It is expected to be above RBS targets target for the next several months. So the extraordinary easing of the RBI is militating against its inflation management responsibility. Uh, and there are also concerns about whether this inflation, which is uh, according to RBI, is driven by supply constraints to get generalized and become core inflation because of persisting inflation expectations and as demand firms up. So there are concerns that inflation might get generalized, might become core inflation, might catch up with us too soon unless RBI withdraws in good time. I'm sure the RBI is uh, quite conscious of that. And I do want to say that uh, 
Withdrawal from extraordinary easing driven by crisis is very important. Uh, the timing, sequencing, and the forward guidance that's given for it. That's an important lesson we learned from the 2008 crisis, not just in the RBI, but central banks around the world. Yes, Dr. Subhanahu, you talked about timing the exit, and Dr. Shakti Kanta Rao has also stated that premature withdrawal of liquidity will hurt growth. Yet, this is a possibility at all times. At the same time, timing the withdrawal has always been risky. So what should the RBI do? Did you have similar fears playing on your might also post the financial crisis? And if you had to relive those days, would you have withdrawn the easy liquidity conditions a little earlier? Well, what is premature withdrawal uh, is not clear in real time. It's always evident only in hindsight, right? And in real time, policymakers, particularly governments and central banks, are operating within the universe of knowledge available to them and uh, uh, making judgments on that basis. It is true that today, as uh, we discussed uh, a short while ago in this conversation, RBI has eased uh, you know, tremendously extraordinary amount of easing, both by way of policy rate cuts and liquidity. And that is uh, their concerns that it might trigger mispricing of risk, it might cause financial instability in uh, down the line. So there's a risk that policies introduced, initiated, to drive a certain objective might actually go counter to that objective if left too long. So if the governor said that uh, premature withdrawal will spook recovery, perhaps he said that uh, with, uh, you know, uh, very advisedly on consideration of the macroeconomic situation today in, the, in India and around the world. And I, as I said before, I'm sure that the RBI is very conscious of timing and sequencing the withdrawal and will do it. Now, going back to the 2008 crisis, I did certainly have concerns about uh, getting back, uh, you know, withdrawing in time. We talked about it in our policy statements, in our media interviews, uh, because Withdrawal from easing has to be very deliberate, very thought through, very well planned, and a lot of forward guidance has to be given. In the event, we were wrong footed in 2008 because of a number of circumstances. This is not a time or occasion to go into all that, but I do want to say that the real time data were telling us something different from what actually was happening underneath. So uh, in 2008, there were some errors of judgment made. And I'm sure that the Reserve Bank uh, is informed by the lessons of those crises, that crisis. Uh, I hope you're right on that, Dr. Subara, because we tend to place governors in a pedestal. And you also spoke about forward guidance. And Shakti Kanta Das has given a forward guidance of accommodating monetary policy this fiscal and continuing with the next fiscal at a time when there's such, so much uncertainty. Is it a really a good idea to commit to such long-term guidance, particularly when inflation is well above the upper end of the mandated band of 4 to 6%? Well, there's a conundrum there, isn't it? Because it is when the financial and economic conditions are uncertain that the market most wants forward guidance from the central bank. And it is exactly when financial and economic conditions are uncertain that the central bank is least able to give forward guidance. So how much forward guidance to give and how definite it should be is a concern not just for the Reserve Bank, but it is uh, an issue that is discussed in central banking policy circles continuously. Uh, if you don't give, if you give too much, too definitive a guidance, the central bank is locking itself into, uh, into a definitive action and cutting its degrees of freedom. On the other hand, if the forward guidance is not definitive, it's too vague, it's of no help. So the, the policy challenge for the central bank is to give guidance that is appropriate, reveal as much as is possible and is necessary, but not spook the market. The most famous example of uh, forward guidance that's gone wrong is the taper tantrum announcement by the Federal Reserve back in 2013 when they said that they were going to taper the quantitative easing, that was well known to the markets. Right from the word go when quantitative easing was started, it was very clear that at some point of time it will be eased. But how the communication should be given and when that should be given went wrong. So giving appropriate forward guidance 
definitive enough to be of some value to market participants at, in such a way that it does not spook the markets is very important. In this particular case, you've spoken about the forward guidance given by the Reserve Bank. I'm sure that they've said that advisedly because uh, industry, uh, you know, indeed all market participants, businesses are making plans on the basis of the forward guidance given by the Reserve Bank. And that's very important in an uncertain situation like this. So I believe the Reserve Bank has done quite well to give forward guidance, but they should also be thinking about when to exit, how to exit, and what forward guidance to give in order to prepare the market for the exit. Well, yes, you're right. That's a really a very tricky question. But now let me move to the even trickier aspect, perhaps, of fiscal monetary policy interface. Most economists believe that fiscal policy should lead with monetary policy at best lending support. Instead, at least what we've seen in India is that most of the heavy lifting has been done by the RBI with relatively feeble response from government. How does our fiscal package of less than about 2% of GDP, if you take a look at the cash outflow, compare with global packages number one? And what do you think is holding government back? It's almost as if contrary to what you would expect, government has learned from 2008, but not quite the real <clears throat> bank. Well, you know, when there's a downturn, when there's an economic crisis, not just in India, around the world, uh, what is required is uh, both fiscal policy by the government and monetary policy easing by the central bank. And ideally, the burden should be shared. In India, the refrain has been, like you mentioned just now, that the burden has fallen disproportionately on the Reserve Bank and the government has not done its share. Yes, the fiscal deficit, which is budgeted at 3.5%, is going to be probably double that, 7% or perhaps even higher. But much of that has gone to make up for the revenue lost and very little by way of fiscal spending, maybe 2% that you mentioned. So the refrain has been that the government has not spent enough on supporting lives and livelihoods. And why has the government not done this? I can only speculate out of perhaps out of concerns about fiscal sustainability. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio uh, the FRBM committee said that that ratio should be at 60%, it's going to 80% this year, and perhaps it'll go much higher. So the government is concerned about fiscal sustainability. And you spoke about uh, inter-country comparisons. Yes, rich countries have been able to throw the kitchen sink at the problem. They've had uh, capacity for massive fiscal easing, which we do not have. We must remember that India entered the crisis in a weak fiscal state. So the ability for fiscal easing was quite limited. So the government's caution or reticence was perhaps informed by concerns about fiscal sustainability. But in the event, I should say that whatever the government has spent, they spent wisely on supporting uh, Manrega, the employment guarantee scheme and on supporting medium and small industries, which have been worst hit by this crisis, and to some extent in supporting health infrastructure. But I believe going forward, next budget, the government should be spending more, should be spending more on livelihood support by way of Manrega. They should be spending more on supporting medium and small industries. And I think they should be spending more on supporting infrastructure because that will lay the foundation for medium term growth. So I believe uh, in the next budget, the government should loose, loosen the fiscal strings more than they've done this time around in this year. I do hope the finance minister listen very carefully to your advice. But let me now just go back to an area of core central banking, inflation targeting. The idea of a monetary policy committee was really to put monetary policy formulation in the hands of a committee rather than the RBI governor alone. But has this very purpose been defeated with the RBI in a sense bypassing the MPC by tinkering with liquidity and effectively lowering interest rates, even while apparently going ahead with the MPC's decision of keeping status quo on interest rates? So what purpose has the entire inflation targeting regime served? So please allow me to give a little bit of context to this. Uh, you know, we introduced inflation targeting in India in 2015. In the first three to four years after introduction of inflation targeting, 
uh, pretty much up to 2019. Inflation was very much within the band, indeed uh, close to the center of the band, 4%. So every, the, the consensus was forming around the view that inflation targeting framework has served India very well. I believe that endorsement is premature because in the first four years after inflation targeting framework has been introduced, the framework has not been tested. Domestic demand conditions were very benign and there was no external situation to pressure inflation in India. But over the last one year, after COVID hit us, the inflation targeting framework has come to test because growth is low, indeed negative, and inflation is firming up above the inflation target. So how does RBI react? How does the MPC react to a situation like this when recovery has to be supported? On the other hand, inflation is high. And the MPC, as we know, has interpreted the mandate flexibly to support growth, support recovery, even as inflation is above target, in the hope and expectation that in the weeks and months ahead, inflation will ease because supply chains will normalize as uh, uh, as uh, food bumper crop comes into the market. Now, if uh, you talked about the RBI as an institution, as an executive, and the MPC probably working at cross purposes, right? Yeah. Because, you know, to understand this, it's also, again, it's important to give some context. Central banks typically have two instruments an interest rate instrument and a balance sheet instrument. In the inflation targeting framework in India, the MPC has been given only the interest rate framework that is control over the repo rate. The entire balance sheet instrument has been left with the RBI executive. Indeed, even the repo rate has been left with the RBI executive. So it's quite possible. I'm not saying it's happened, but it's quite possible it's quite imaginable that there will be a situation where the MPC and the RBI executive will work at cross purposes. Okay. So when the inflation targeting framework comes up for review in March next year, it's very important to fix some of these things. Indeed, there are many other things that need to be fixed based on the experience of the last four years. I don't know if we have the time to go into this, but certainly this is one area that needs to be fixed when the inflation targeting framework comes up for review in March. Yes, certainly there are many, you know, fine-tuning fine much, or fine-tuning remains as far as the inflation policy framework is concerned. But in hindsight, is it possible that we also paid a very high price in terms of the growth foregone by somehow interpreting the inflation target very rigidly at 4%? Well, uh, you know, it depends on the regime at that time and on the appreciation of the Reserve Bank of the macroeconomic situation. As I said, uh, perhaps in order to make up for the high inflation uh, up until 2013, uh, there was uh, some uh, some compensation done for that because central banks today around the world are talking about inflation over a period of time, not at a point of time. The Federal Reserve in its inflation targeting review said that they're going to be using that phrase, you know, that low for longer, which is that they're going to target average inflation and not point by point inflation. So if you look at it from that perspective, I think uh, what RBI has done subsequent to my leaving has been quite appropriate to compensate for high inflation in an earlier period of time. Uh, perhaps uh, they've kept inflation low. Okay. I, I hope you're proved right on that, Dr. Subarao. But now Thank you. Me, I hope so too. <laughs> now let me just move to another area of banking. You know, and here let me start by asking you what is perhaps the hottest topic at the moment, the RBI working group's suggestion to allow entry of corporates into banking. We've seen a huge outcry against any such relaxation led by former governor, Dr. Raghuram Raj and Deputy Governor Birar Acharya to mention just two. Though this, this was allowed under the 2013 policy when you were governor and we didn't see such an outcry. What has changed to out occasion this kind of outpouring now as compared to 2013? Well, thank you for that question, Maitli. Yes, uh, back in 2013, too, the guidelines did allow for corporate entry into banks, albeit with some stringent caveats. The big justification then, as it is today, is that if we do not allow corporates into banks, they will not be 
sufficient credible applicants with deep enough pockets to start private banks. So the question is, the one you asked, why was that accepted as part of the course then? And why is it, why there's so much disquiet today? I've reflected on that. I can think of one or two reasons. First, public perception of banks has been deeply shaped by recent episodes, frauds in uh, Punjab National Bank, self-dealing, alleged self-dealing in Yes Bank, uh, pressures in Lakshmi Vilas Bank and uh, Punjab Maharashtra Bank. Public perception is that of banks is of poor corporate governance, unchecked connected lending, unethical behavior, fraudulent practices. Their confidence that their deposits in banks will be safe is at an all-time low. Their apprehension is that if corporates are allowed into banking in a culture like this, there'll be a temptation for them and there'll be an opportunity for them to use the low-cost deposits to finance their own businesses, what is called connected lending. And no matter how finely, how accurately, how stringently rules and regulations are written down, it is very difficult to check, much less prevent, connected lending. So banks will become even uh, more prone to self-dealing. So that's the first concern. The second concern, I believe, uh, or the second difference between 2013 and today, I believe has to do with criteria. We know that the Reserve Bank applies fit and proper criteria to evaluate applicants for bank licenses. The fit and proper criteria cannot fully be objectively written down, much of it is subject to judgment. Notably, back in 2013, no corporate applicant passed the test. Perhaps the apprehension is that this time around, the fit and proper criteria will be interpreted more loosely. So those are some of the reasons I believe are responsible for much greater disquiet about corporate entering into banking this time around. Well, that's a very sad indictment of our corporates that no corporate was really found fit and proper in 2013. But I guess that is true not only of Indian corporates, but corporates across the world in large, as we are seeing so many instances coming to light. But another RBI discussion paper had recently proposed a cap on the tenures for private bank CEOs. 10 years in the case of promoters and 15 years for non-promoters. <coughs> the events were invited by 15th July 2020, but nothing further has been heard from the RBI. Since the suggestion was made following the Yes Bank debacle, the long tenure of the CEO was seen as one of the reasons for things coming to such a pass. <laughs> and the instances of CEOs of private banks, other private banks, continuing for 20 years, 25 years, never a very good thing. How do you see this suggestion? As something that is very much needed? Is it something that the RBI should act upon? Well, most certainly. And I think the answer lies in your question. Because, uh, uh, you know, a CEO should not stay for too long, for reasons that you mentioned, because he or she becomes too familiar, too comfortable, and uh, it could lead to bad judgments, wrong decisions, and even succumbing to temptation of self-dealing, etc. On the other hand, the CEO tenure should not be too short, because then the horizon is not long enough for the CEO to take uh, decisions that are in the long-term interest, the short-term priorities, short-term compulsions might override the bank's long-term interest, something, a malady that we're seeing in public sector banks. So it should not be too long. It should not be too short. So the RBI has been quite right in floating a discussion paper about limiting the tenure of a CEO, 10 or 15 years, as the case may be. And I believe that's a good thing. Indeed, I think they should extend that even to public sector banks. Uh, why not? Because banks are banks, and the uh, tenure of a CEO matters for a private bank, and as much for a public sector bank, perhaps more. Absolutely. And indeed, we, we've seen the fallout of short tenure of CEOs of public sector banks. So it's very important that the RBI also comes out with some guidelines for tenure of CEOs of public sector banks. Oh, I'm not aware if the NIAC committee spoke about this, but it's an important issue. 
Oh, absolutely. I think it's about finding the Goldilocks mean, even as far as tenures are concerned. But thank you so much, Dr. Subarok, for taking time out to share your views with our viewers. And last but not the least, here's wishing you and your family and all our viewers a wonderful 2021 from all of us at ETNA. Thank, thank you indeed for this interview. Thank you.